Okay, hello and welcome. I'm Laura Kronk, Associate Director for the School of Writing at the New School, and we are so pleased to have Kaveh Kanem here tonight. We value our partnership with Kaveh Kanem tremendously. Their innovation and vision enrich the artistic lives of everyone lucky enough to come into contact with them through their outstanding public programs and support of scholarship and literature. Um, I'd like to say a special thanks to Allison Myers and Hafiza Jeter. And without further ado, please welcome Hafiza Jeter to the mic. Well, welcome, everyone. As she said, I'm Hafiza Jeter, and I'm the Programs and Communications Coordinator at Cave Khanum, a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of African American poets. Our thanks go out to Robert Polito and Lori Lynn Turner for their thoughtful work and making a welcoming place for Cave Khanum at the New School. We also wish to thank our funders, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the, and the Giles Whiting Foundation. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, we're excited to present our new works series featuring C.M. Burroughs, Jonathan Moody, and Yona Harvey. C.M. Burroughs has been a fellow of Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and the Cave Condom Foundation. The Vital System, her debut collection of poetry, was published by Tupelo Press in fall 2012. Her poetry has appeared in journals including Plowshares, Jubilat, Callaloo, Volt, and Bat City Review. She is the Elma Stuckey Poet in Residence at Columbia College of Chicago, where she will be joining them full time as an assistant professor of poetry. Douglas Kearney said of CM Burroughs' The Vital System, here is terrible resilience and dangerous vitality. Jonathan Moody received his MFA from the University of Pittsburgh and is a Cave Canem alum. His poetry has appeared in African American Review, Crab Orchard Review, Gathering Ground, a reader, a reader celebrating Cave Canem's first decade, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, Story South, and Tidal Basin Review, among others. He is the author of The Doomy Poems, praised by Terence Hayes for its idiosyncratic charm and an innovative funkiness that transcends the ruckus and heartache of our modern world. Yona Harvey is a, liter is a literary artist living in Pittsburgh. She is the author of the poetry collection, Hemming the Water, and is the recipient of an individual artist grant from the Pittsburgh Foundation. Her poems can be found in Jubilat, Gulf Coast, Callaloo, West Branch, and various journals and anthologies, including A Poet's Craft, a comprehensive guide to making and sharing your poetry. Cave Economy co-founder Toy Derricott describes his first collection as an extraordinary debut, a collection that takes the reader to dizzying, dizzying uncertainties, a place between what's real and what isn't, what's intimate and what's strange, between evil and good. Please welcome CM Burroughs. Whistled. <laughs> I can't whistle, I'm just jealous, that's all. So I'm going to read primarily from my collection, The Vital System, tonight, but I'm also, just for fun, going to throw in a few new poems, um, but I'll tell you when. So I'm going to read the very first poem in the book, which I read first at all of my readings because it opens up the mythology of the book and gives a reason for why all the other poems exist. Dear Incubator, and it's, am I loud enough? Can everyone hear? Okay. Dear Incubator, at six months gestation, I am a fabrication born far too soon, my body a stone in a steaming basket. I remember you, figureless, a black kaleidoscope. Turn, turn, the dangerous loom of the loom of you, patterns pressing upon me inside, nothing luminous is my mother's womb, this second attempt at formation, a turn. The nurse slides her wedding band past my hand, beyond my elbow, and over my shoulder. I am one pound twelve ounces, and already feminine, knowing nothing of it, I am trying to be clear. I was first fascinated, then afraid of the shapes rise from your darkness and their growth toward me. I wailed under their weight. My eyes were shuttered by lids. My skin was translucent. Anyone could see me working. 
How can I ask you from inside the poem, what senses did I have so early, so unformed? I was tangled in tubes. They kept my heart pumping. They kept my lungs from collapsing, food to the body, oxygen to the brain. You were everything and nothing, a surrogate, a packaging of half-made sensory detail, a past. I have scars on my belly in shapes of fish, where sensors tore thin skin. What a tragedy to be powerless, and yet I controlled the choreography of everyone around me, the check of vitals, arms through the arm ports, my parents' speech. Also, there were surgeons. I'm trying to tell you something important about after they opened you and took me out. I was infected, could command nothing of my legs for years. The surgeons, thin blades shining into nothing. Imagine the cuts, blood spread along the lip of each, spilling as my skin parts, someone bringing cotton to catch it. Is it your fault? I don't know. I was in a state I've explained. I don't know what you let in. Perhaps. Do you know lovers ask about these scars, touch these raised scars? So much has happened. I'm black. I have a dead sister. I love you, but, and believe this, I mostly want to talk. So, Dear Incubator mentions my younger sister who died in 98 at the age of 11. She had um, a rare liver disease and rejected a transplant, ultimately. But I wrote a poem some years ago now that addressed my driving from Pittsburgh to Chicago to visit her grave. And uh, this is essentially what happened. I ran into a, a deer on the road, and there was so much traffic that I couldn't move, and I just felt the entire body of the thing uh, go under. But think away the blood. The tumble of bone kissing the undercarriage, absence, my precise pain driving against the head of a doe, the doe's body turning, the question beyond just rising, presence, my precise destination, your grave in Virginia, visible before it goes under, as into sludge, then breaking, as into surf of rock, gravity of bone, the stopping of a body, yours. Had I turned sooner, had I asked the correct question, taste of blood in my throat. Was it your face in the earth's face, please, mine? Driving to Virginia with the destination of your grave, I drive into a doe. The eyes bulb gently in their sockets, wide ears bend toward my bumper, bone and body slam against the undercarriage. Your birthday, nine years after your death, it is 5 a.m., I spend the remaining six hours thinking of that body splayed in the road, how long dead, how I travel to you with blood. So this next poem begins with an epigraph by uh, Amiri Baraka. Beneath the necessity of talking or the necessity for being angry, and beneath the actual core of life, we make reference to get digging deep into some young woman and listening to her come. Some young woman. Begins and ends requiring interpretation. Folk. Metal twine choking a length of straw. Slender. Bound. Flightless. Comprehends herself. Otherwise slips out of roughly translated versions of self. Has opened for men who've harmed with good intention, slapped, spanked, begged for, begged from, bruised nostalgically, left, accomplished patterns of leaving, exits reflecting ways in, loved, desired to love herself, called a litany of graceful names, strove to embody them, tasted herself, tasted feminine, choked, even glimpsed herself a woman she found unapproachable, could not breathe, as a bird groping a wire, so shivered. I'm going to 
read a few new poems now, a couple of them. I've been thinking about the notion of the love poem lately, messy love poems. Is there any other? My home having come to this. In the porn factory, none locks her head in a box. None is trapezed or gagged. Everyone wants to know what my inside looks like and a transparency about the skin. It is not long before one stops his hinged posture and says, Look at me, I love you, which my whole body opens to hear as if it has been uttered before by someone I loved. I give myself as I've given myself to a field at dusk without distraction or thought. Here, my body, my body's inside, here, all its tender red pulp. Omen 1 To put your hands into the machine will mean to be overcome, so that you are black or all that you will say is black, because it hasn't a name. You are overcome because it is unnamed, and you want to call it. You call it and want for it, him and rivet to come. You will suffer desire, suffer it. Nineteen ninety eight. When he wrote, There's a glove in the crick, I asked, Are you from the South? He was, more or less, and when I said it, South, and why I haven't gone back, my sister ended up in my mouth, like a bullfrog, like cherry blossom, choking. What sister? What sister? He meant creek, you know, but I got the usage and the origin wept. He was my student, sweet and smelled like a delicious word. Anyway, the question wasn't so much what as when. There's a point at which one weeps so much that you have to find a way to call it something else. And this was a poem that I wrote for that reason. Metaphor for Weeping a door, a small mouth at its bottom for vermin, cats, children. Beyond the door, a scatter of rooms. At the edge of it, or the boiling middle, a red window. The sill may be kissed, soothed even, the latch turned, lifted, swiveled of all the ways to open a window. Watch your fingers, the panes are wet with, you've heard it before. Be careful of your fingers. It is red. It calls to be raised. Don't scathe your palms. This is the scalding center. Answer it. Lift it. You will have no words on the other side. You will have your surrendering hands. The window is seething, is streaking, is... You must increase your threshold for pain so this does not become a chronic problem. I'd like to read now the title poem of the book, The Vital System, uh, which came actually one of the summers where I was in residency at the uh, Cave Canem retreat. And I took it upon myself to write a series of uh, sonnets. And this is a poem that came directly from that. After I tighten the sonnets, I should say. You're going to listen to it. It's not a sonnet. What are you talking about? The Vital System. One. I, in strutting cock stance, anatomy blazing, phonic self-made midlight, aperture active in the jaw, and cambers of maw guarding the vagina's axis, light vying to tincture body systems, rumored only red, man's bleak reverie, the female constrained in port, magma, ochre-washed causeways, the late prism of the metamorphic world. I transformed across canvas stretched white, a black bone bicontinental collage, a put-upon pace, belligerent incubator steaming the new world's afterbirth, but alive, but a beginning spectrum. Two. Jump seed tangles in orchids inflamed globe, frames a scene, inches inside, 
verde, ardor, green atop green vertigo prairie, tendered crevasse, yet undergrowth, her bastion evidences fable, he plants his rollicking root, bloodlets, not enough to regret, repent, a body politic ravels, he hastens her tinning, inches outside, series of labels lie like dress, this female, chartered, docile dream. Three. Labial. Women grapple hook women. Plum loaf. Garnet welt. Milk smear. Complexion and arousal lidded cunt. Mode. Additive. Rectum tension. Segregated jetty. Please. Stutters. Carve the runnel. Diagram bellow. What angle? Sap. Cradle. Ruin. Hyradule on knee tip. American worship origin. Cusp side of mouth's vivid chroma. Posy fed, leaking, beetle, limp, weeps, cervix. So, um, I was giving a reading, uh, this two summers ago at Yaddo to some other fellows that were there, and I was reading the poem I'm about to read to you, which, um, is based off of the very day that my sister died. And when we got home, there was a cardinal uh, just perched on the veranda, and it kept running itself into the uh, French doors. It was ours. So, on impact. But my, this, it matters, my fellows at Yado kept seeing these birds while I was reading the poem, and so they felt very <laughs> affected afterward. <laughs> On impact, we watch the bird begin at the veranda's edge and taking off with mission into the French doors five feet ahead, a red bird reddening, sexed in vermeil, damaged, days this continued. You saw it, the bird dying for the bird, how to love the self, a week at least, at last, the elongated click of its mouth attention, a repetition the work of watching its attempts to die, the words please and don't mind from every throat in that house. As much as we were witnesses, we did not see its beak gag, did not see it die, but gently noticed no refrain, no rhythm at the glass, its body or betrothal gone. So um, my mother attended my book launch, and afterwards she said it. So you've had a lot of really bad relationships, huh? <laughs> I said, well, no, I've had amazing relationships. They've just provoked this poetry, and I am not always I. Didn't, didn't work. She's not convinced. For the circus of I, one, I was accustomed to being sewn open. My muscles splayed under sweating digits. My mouth bracketed tug. When language failed, there was the body, and his velocity flattened palm, trochaic metered striking. Two. In running, I came upon you, crawled through the door under your calf line's truss, pulled myself up ropes of tendons, arriving quite near the heart, gazed about your conjugate system, adored your inside. Suddenly, you had a woman in you, I, who loved, who wanted, loved. You and she hyphened between layer shucked, glow wrought, spoon fed syllables under the phasing moon. She called you gratitude, seeing, seen, something given, pocketed in the jaw, stored, hoarded, you and she linked in the grammar of. Four. What's amazing, the color of your anatomy slaughterhouse red, only the body intact, not even hanging, all the inside parts, seminal vesicles carefully stewing, pressed in. I memorize your slopes, causeways, wire systems. I measure my breath, disturb nothing, listen to what sounds like rain thrumming your shoulders, what rain always sounds like from undercover, insistent tapping. Five. She begins to itch, wants to touch the shuddering lung, lie against the paranoid liver. She has been so good, 
settling for warmth, not daring to reach out her hand into the screen of veins. But, gratitude turned desire, she slips through a loose skein in the abdominal oblique, huddles inside the four-walled bunker, for good or ill, waits to be moved. All right, a few more. For a good man. The heart bones lunar note melody places your red hand on your lover's wet breast. Gather lit mouths, yours and a feeding. Commit to a feeding. Enthusiasm evokes bones dilation, simple subtraction of frame. Dislike the cave factory, dislike darkness, love the foundation, their being foundation. Once you were a structure of damage, named solitude everything except ocean within ocean. Now, in the intelligent transportation of language, there is your hand and her jawline, their expectant, blood-logged opening. In the personal camp, eroticism. Once I find the maze opening to the cane break, I see we are still quite removed from escape. You are black under the chassis, detergent and oil puddling across your black skin. You are so beautiful, I say it. You are so beautiful. Body. I join you. Stick my fingers into the organs or engine. Everything so warm, so dark, I can't tell. I move my hand into the wrist. Fix it when your mouth opens with sight. Your own wrist, rotal against some metal, one of us, man, machine, ovary, guns to life. I feel that we will get away. So I'm going to end with the very last poem in my book, which is really my most important poem ever, um, because it was finally the successful poem that I could write about my sister, and not write from what is a suppose common space of the I and the grief of the self, but in trying to understand that perhaps the other had a choice, the other had something gracious to do in passing, right? A young girl and a hooded attendant. You must have in your muscles your threshold of pain, said when the light, whole, or gracious hand appeared. Yes. First look behind you to the macrame of tubers, rigs, and your body's openings that were made openings through which slender metal mouths sucked or spewed all the black black, the sterilized tears, the life and lifelessness of that place. Must have looked on all it amounted, surveyed the wilt, rot, measurable ravage, and looked away. What intelligent sickness. Rather, what is in front of you answers how the water and the wood bridge leading to the water signify a freedom only felt when going under. Count backward from 100. 100. 99. 98. It doesn't take what you think it takes to leave the body. What it requires is that you admit yourself, the bleak shelter of your body against the calm. 92. 91. Of what impresses your optic nerve, yourself, woundless, and saturating that desire, further corrected colors. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I want to first thank uh, the New School and Hafiza for setting this. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to be reading with CM and Yona. Uh, I'll be reading from my book, The Doomy Poems. It's actually uh, a non-linear love story. And we start out in Houston in the present. And so periodically what I'll do is I'll let you know when we're switching times and settings. For those of you who are familiar with Pedro Almodovar's films, they're structured like that where we start out in the present and then we have an extended flashback and then we gradually work our way back to the present. And the main character is Doomy. And I'm going to read poems mainly from his perspective, as well as Irina's, his love interest. 
First poem is entitled, Do Me's Hallucination Blues. Houston, the present. After sneaking onto the metro rail, I see a curvaceous woman, shoulder length hair, so frizzy it could wrap around the pole in case she loses her balance. Through the back of her white blouse, through her brown skin, I see blue sand trickle down her spine. The amount that settled at her hips stops increasing towards both ribs as soon as I inch closer. Beneath the blue sand lies the gold key I wanted to give to her, to my Pittsburgh studio apartment. Irina? My cry blows the sand away, along with all her memories. I'm sorry. I don't believe we've met. The next poem I'm going to read is dedicated to a blues musician slash singer by the name of Furry Lewis. Uh, one of the things I like about Furry Lewis's music is that he taught me that there's a humorous side to the blues that doesn't often present itself in the music. Heartbreak then got Doomy's wires crossed. My coffee tastes like tea and my beer tastes like wine. Said my coffee tastes like tea and my beer like wine. Doc said, drink eight glasses of oil a day and you'll feel fine. There's a city in Texas called Pittsburgh. The church's stained glass adorns my hot dog like relish. Pittsburgh, one year earlier. Uh, if you ever go to Pittsburgh, there's this famous hot dog spot. Um, make sure you get the small order fries. <laughs> no, nah, seriously, like, if you get the large order, you're going to need a triple bypass surgery like as soon as you eat like a third of it. So, This poem is entitled The O. She must be Star Trek stone the way she chows down hot dogs. Blueberry kush powering the warp drive appetite, allowing her mouth to move faster than the speed of light. Her white zip front cardigan exposes enough neck to reveal the gold name medallion, Irina. The brown leggings cling tightly, Daver Copperfielding false impressions of bottom half nudity. Her home plate so plump, her man needs a catcher's mitt to squeeze every inch. I wonder if she has room on her exclusive roster for a pinch hitter in case her cleanup batter loses patience. Falls in such a slump, he freezes at change-ups headed for the middle strike zone area, chasing erratic grand slam grandeur instead of line drive alliance. Dumi pontificates on the meaning behind a kiss, the whisper in the brain. Uh, the last phrase, the whisper in the brain, I stole that uh, from Graham Greene. It's a line from his novel, uh, The End of the Affair. A kiss on the forearm asks, how was your day? A kiss on the elbow twirls you around in your black and white asymmetrical dress. A kiss on the chin pops off white wine bottle corks. A kiss on the ear makes you strut in suede knee-high boots. The first kiss on the neck kicks out my roommate. The second one slides your dress down your festive feet. A kiss on the shoulder screens Tommy's incoming calls. A kiss on the stomach puts my television on mute. A kiss on the eyelids means you'll see me in your dreams. The whisper in your brain trains you to never mention my name out loud while you're talking in your sleep. Irina, the waitress who's always on the clock. My kiss on Dumi's cheek plants his hormones in a bucket of ice. These next two poems I'll read actually take place in uh, Harris Theater, which is a pretty popular uh, theater in Pittsburgh. Uh, the woman on the cover represents Irina. So Doomy and Irina, they're actually watching 
Pedro Almodovar's film Matador, but they can't focus on the film because their, their minds are somewhere else completely. And it also makes reference to a place called Dreaming Ant, which was a, a DVD rental place where I actually got my second education. So this is where I actually discovered Pedro Almodovar's work. While watching the screening of Matador, Irina reflects on the detour she and Dumi made at Dreaming Ant. Dumi never knew Miles Davis composed a movie soundtrack, which is why he rents Elevator to the Gallows. Everyone leaves Dreaming Ant smelling like coffee and cigarettes, except Dumi. His cologne fights back the stench of smoke the way I fight the urge to kiss him beneath these mistletoes of icicles. It's so cold, we can see our secular breath billow and intersect again, again, and again. Only so many times, intoxicated desire can collide with infatuation and walk away without a scratch. Viva Pedro, the Almodovar Retrospective Series, Harris Theater, downtown. I'm sitting next to Irina, who smells like she's exfoliated her brown skin with coffee grounds. You'd think she'd have her eyes glued to the young Antonio Banderas prowling through Madrid in tight jeans. But Almodovar strips him of the stereotypical Latin lover mold making Antonio so self-conscious about his sexuality, he rapes his mentor's girlfriend to prove his manhood. I glance at Irina, her crossed legs flexing fresh bruises on firm quadriceps. In her mind, she's ripping the theater's red curtain off and brandishing it below the waistline of her silk tunic dress. In slow motion, Tommy darts towards her the red curtain cape swirls, Tommy's horns piercing the movie screen. We see Tommy's lower half, the tail, wagging side to side like a pendulum. Irina bows, the audience showers her with popcorn roses. Death, the cold camera lens, eclipses Tommy's aggression. Irina wants to be adored. I prefer stone roses, the firmness of dove wings pressing between my thighs. These lavender legs of mine don't miss Tommy's touch because Dumi massages them with his eyes. Head cocked at an impossible angle, grin revealing a scented candle hidden inside. Tongue tough enough to strike against the wick. But with a deep sigh, he extinguishes the spark. That's do me all right. Romantically anti-pagan. Too sweet to sacrifice the body of our friendship. Pittsburgh, five months earlier. Um, I'm gonna read a couple more poems from the Doomy poems, and I'm gonna read uh, one poem from the sequel that I'm working on. Um, these poems I'm about to read, I'm going to condense it, but it's, it's called the Mixtape Series. So Doomy and Irina have exchanged mixtapes to one another, and I wanted to find a way to condense the narrative uh, as opposed to having uh, the book be 200 pages. I wanted to, to truncate the narrative, right? Um, so I, I figured out a way that I can introduce events that have already happened, like off stage or off screen. So these are events that have happened prior to. This is uh, Irina's mixtape for Doomy. And I'll just read a few tracks. Track two, Joy Division, Transmission. When we reached the gate, I unbuckled my seatbelt and stretched over the firm console of your chest made you think I'd forgotten my security code. Just wanted you to sneak a longer peek at my bare waist, our bodies positioned like the positive charge sign. Track four, Lil John featuring LMFAO, Shots. 
With deep sighs, I reeled in the anchor of my reason. For each hour, I waited for you to show at the club. At nine, the anchor was slightly above my heart. By 10, it reached my upper lip. 11, you walked through the door. As I fixed my hair, I grinned from extension to extension. My black belted A-line sweater dress arrested any plans you had of being the perfect gentleman. Couldn't wait to put my arms around your Grand Canyon shoulders, to wrap these legs around your waist, lift them in the air, and click my heels until they spark. Doomy's mixtape for Irina. So actually, uh, out of these, there are 10 tracks on the mixtape, so out of these 10, two of them were the same song, so they're meant to be together, right? Track four, Joy Division, Transmission. You leaned over me, your blouse inched away from your waist. Low-rise jeans call for low-rise undies, giving the illusion you go anywhere with no panties on. Our bodies formed into a plus sign. Tommy, the dead battery, oozing drool on my back seat. Track five, Lil John featuring LMFAO, Shots. When I came through the spot, you winked with so much force, it looked like your right eye blew me a kiss. In that black belted A-line sweater dress, your breasts damn near stretched the V-neck into an L. Soon as I sat down, you stood up and parked your slender frame sideways on my lap. I grabbed the cherry jello shot from a tray and placed the cup on the coaster of your cleavage. My lips gripped the cup's plastic rim. As I pretended I was licking your inner walls, you dug your nails into my neck and dared me to come up for air. And this is the last poem I'll read, it's from the sequel. Uh, so in the sequel, it's set entirely in Texas. Uh, Doomy is, is in a bad place. And so there's this black baby by the name of Cupid, right? And Doomy steals Cupid's bow and arrows. So how do people fall in love if Cupid doesn't have his bow and arrows? Well, Southern superstition, if you touch a black baby's hair, you'll get good luck. So this is the crisis that, that Cupid is going through. Uh, this poem is told in the voice of a barbershop. And I'm, I'm actually interested in mythology in terms of like different variations of stories. So this is the barbershop's take on, on what's happened and it's dedicated to Patricia Smith, Messy Barbershop. Bad enough foreclosure signs keep sprouting like dandelions, but white folks done figured since Cupid got hustled out his bow and arrows, they can touch his mohawk, hoping he'll restore luck in their love lives. Last week, I caught Cupid at Dave and Buster's, hovering above a table. Young blood was playing air hockey against himself. The size of the naps on that baby's mohawk looked like he had blackberries covering his head. I've been running this here barbershop since General Gordon Granger arrived at Galveston, stood on Ashton Villa's top balcony, and announced that the slaves, who still thought they were slaves, had been liberated for two years, and not once, not ever, have I cut hair for free. But if Cupid flew in here, right now, I'd make an exception. Anyway, like I was saying, out of my peripheral vision, I spotted this cat, Doomy, pushing his way through the crowd. The cash wad he pulled out his pocket, bigger than a head of lettuce. He had $100 riding on Cupid's failed air hockey trick shot attempt, off the side, off the Lone Star beer bottle, through two cell phones, right in the hole. Cupid nailed the shot. When it came for Doomy to cough up the dough, Cupid could tell it was store-bought counterfeit, not made from scratch. All Cupid wanted was an apology, but Doomy stole that baby's bow and arrows. Wasn't easy. Cupid scotch taped the back ends of pacifiers to his fingers, boy bout the makeshift brass knuckles. At the 3.41 seconds, Doomy's nose was flatter than a plantain. I'm telling you, son, a gorilla hatched out of the goose egg on Doomy's head just to make the fight fair. Deacon Jones, don't take this the wrong way, but if this story were in the good book, more people will show for Bible study. Hope you don't mind me asking, 
But what possessed you to get those Chinese characters tattooed on your bicep? By the time you're my age, those letters will have stretched into an entirely different language, Sanskrit. You feel me? Well, the almond scent from some woman's opalescent glitter lotion aroused do me back to consciousness. The air hockey disc he grabbed a hold of sailed like a kite and landed in the bramble of Cupid's mohawk. The manager, who spent several minutes trying to remove the disc without breaking it in half like a comb, gave new meaning to the term customer service. By the time the disc was out, Doomy had disappeared. Ought to be a YouTube video with 666 views featuring a song called I'm Bad Like Cupid, the blind black baby who got hustled for his golden love poison arrows and mohawk mojo, who don't accept no pity. Life tossed him elephant shit. He taught himself to play piano. One of these days, Cupid gonna see Doomy walking down the road of peace and play Northeast Texas Boogie Woogie Blues all up and down Doomy's spine. Hope baby boy don't pull an O.J. Simpson and go to jail for stealing back the stuff that belongs to him. Best believe black babies who commit crimes in Texas get tried as adults. Thank you. Hey. Um, thank you, Kavi Khanum. Thank you, people of the New School. Now I sound like a broken record. I'm really glad to be here reading with CM and Jonathan. Every time I uh, want to go off on Pittsburgh, I'm, re I'm reminded about how good it is. <laughs> That's where I met these people. Okay. Um... I think I'm gonna open with a poem that's not in the book so I don't chicken out of reading it based on time. And I'll just say my mother is a, <laughs> she's a Pentecostal minister, but she's also the person who introduced me to Rick James, Sarah Vaughn, Etta James, she's just full of contradictions like most people I love. People who like jog five miles and then smoke a cigarette. <laughs> All right, so performance perm. I'd rather be a blind girl, Etta James. Lord, Etta, something told me my mama waited too long to mention it was over. When I saw you with that girl and y'all was talking, her neighbor saw you with that girl and y'all was talking, cueing your music all summer long. Something deep down scotch, something deep down and water, something deep down gin, Something deep down you, something deep down said it was over. When I saw you gone and cry girl, she knew how to keep company. All my muscles deep down, undone now, girl, I shoulda. Something told me, something told me had your name Etta, 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 and I'd rather let the men holler after me, and I'd rather let the women shake their heads. Something told me relish the cool. I was just sitting here thinking of a single ice cube, thinking, melted, thinking at the bar counter, thinking, 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 far from conversation. You sang the songs and I'm scared to be by myself. Your mama warned you not to. And I'd rather, and I'd rather, and I'd rather be by myself, yo. Yo, hmm, and yo, 
I see y'all know what I'm talking about when I say sweet sin and excess and yo. I see y'all know what I'm talking about when I say sweet sin and excess and yo and yo and yo and yo the smoke when I look down into my glass and say yo summer yo and yo and revealing it's yo damp sky yo 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 and yo when I saw you with that same person and I'm scared to be by myself and holler after me too long something told me okay um the rest of the poems i'll read from the book to describe my body walking to describe my body walking i must go back to my mother's body walking with an aimless switch in this moment of baptismal snow or abysmal flurry. There's a shadow of free fall frenzy and her unhurried the way snowflakes are unhurried toward transformation at my living room window. She moves unlabored. She will not ask me to invite her in, but she will expect it. I will open the door to her. She is my mother, even if she is made of snow and ice and air and the repetition of years, a means, a ways, she came out of trees surrounding me. I see her cross, now the creak in her patent leather shoes, their navy glimmer like a slick hole I might peer over and fall into against so much snow, weighing down the prayerful arms of sycamores which doused the bushes last autumn. Her little hearse broke down near the exit that leads to my house. Now she must walk. She will be tired. I will let her in, though she will not ask. She has come so far past the mud and twigs, the abandoned nests. This time of year, she can't tell the living from the dead. The pathway is mostly still, except for her moving with the snow, becoming the snow. Forgive, forgiveness, she is a stamp in it, the tapping of boots at the porch steps, not spring or summer, just her advancing, multiplying, falling through branches, there's a flurry of her. Mm. Hurricane. So my daughter, she's 13 now, but uh, <laughs> she was born in New Orleans. She grew up in Pittsburgh, and in Pittsburgh, there's this little carnival that comes to town every spring, and there's a ride there called the Hurricane. Hurricane. Four tickets left, I let her go. First born into a hurricane. I thought she escaped the floodwaters. No, but her head is empty of the drowned for now, though she took her first breath below sea level. Ah, ah, and ah, mama, let me go. She speaks 
what every smart child knows to get grown you unlatch your hands from the grown and up and up and up and up she turns latched in the seat of a hurricane you let your girl what you let your girl what i did so she do i did so she do girl you can ride a hurricane and she do and she do and she do and she do she do make my river an ocean memorial baptist protestant birth my girl walked away from a hurricane and she do and she do and she do and she do she do take my hand a while longer the haunts in my pocket i'll keep to a hum katrina was a woman i knew when you were an infant she rained on you and she do and she do and she do and she do um I'm going to read two more poems. This poem, <laughs> I'm trying to work through these sound issues, so I'm sorry <laughs> if you just, you got to like <laughs> the sound. I'm trying to work through these, I don't know, questions that I have about sound and things that you can suggest with sound by the way that you say it. Um, and part of it comes out of having kids and having code language around them. And I think about code languages in other spaces too, words that sound like cuss words and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, now they're older, it's not such a big deal, but I'm still interested in the project. Okay, so, sound part three, ostinato. All the world's wars commence in the head. Hunched in a thimble, I wept mercy. Once blotted out trees, well, made some second guess me. Speak, ought not act so ugly. Said, ought not act so ugly hunched in a thimble i wept yes yes won't make no apologies no sir who will take on this burden ought not walk alone said ought not walk alone in my sleep i wandered Stitch, 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 stitch. That's the way they do you, said. That's the way they do you. Words can make a mountain. Words can make a mountain. No pulpits in the thimble, said. No pulpits in the thimble. Head, ha, head, ha, said. Head, shoulders, knees, and leg work ought not act so ugly. Ought not act so ugly. No acres for want in a thimble, said. No acres for want in a thimble. All I could do was roll, 
said all I could do was roll hmm hmm stitch 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 I know not what I know not what okay last poem and also last poem in the book also called Sound, part four, notes on polyphony. At first, I thought my head was too much with me. Take it off, I heard a voice say. Your head, you got to take it off. So I closed my eyes and took my head by the ears and turned. It came off easy, my head, like all my life it was waiting for me to unscrew it. So I sat it down quietly beside me, and this allowed my mouth, which all before had been sewed shut, to open and sing. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? And my hips, torso, and upright arms trembled at that sudden a cappella. I want to thank you for hearing this small trickle in a sea. I am trying to steady myself as I wait. There's a bored shark coloring the water. There's a girl cradling her head somewhere. She is lost, and someone has left her at the shore without a song, without a whistle. There is only her blood and the blood of her siblings. There is only the sun, like the glimmer of the state's buttons, erasing the girl. You have placed her in my throat, and now I can reattach my head. And the girl is inside me, she can move now as my body moves, my neck, my head nodding. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for CM, Jonathan, and Yona. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We have books available for sale in the back, and the reception is free. Please stay. <laughs>